Okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone. This is Marcy Darnofsky from the Center for Genetics and Society. And I'm so glad that you're all here today for this conversation with George Anna, being interviewed by Lisa Ikimoto about uh, George's new book, Genomic Messages. And um, we'll uh, just, I'll have a few introductory remarks here, and then we'll get started with the conversation. And then uh, at uh, about uh, halfway through, or a little bit more than that, we'll um, switch to uh, the part of the conversation that we want you to contribute to. And for that, we invite you to submit any comments or questions that you have um, using that Q&A box that you see at the bottom right of your screen. And you can do that starting now at any time during this conversation. And we really welcome and encourage you uh, that you do that. Um, so let's see some of the housekeeping things to let you know about. The first is that um, this event is being recorded. And um, the reason that we're doing that is because we are able to archive all these conversations on our website and on uh, CGS's YouTube channel. Great. Uh, we wanted to show you that at this point we have um, a, a really terrific archive of past Talking Biopolitics conversations. So um, what you see on the screen now are the most recent ones. Um, they're in chronological order and it's a real um, wealth of uh, videos. And I know that we've heard people are using these for classes, they're watching them and uh, for their own purposes, and we really invite you to make use of this resource. So we also, in addition to those, there's another screen full of some of the earlier conversations. Um, and uh, there are some real treasures here. Um, let's see, other housekeeping um, information. One is that we um, are using a Twitter feed. We're live tweeting this with the hashtag, with the hashtag, I think it's hashtag talking biopolitics. And, um, we also wanted to take this moment to invite you to the upcoming uh, Talking Biopolitics, which is scheduled for Thursday, November 19th, same time, same station, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific time, 2 p.m. East Coast time. And that conversation um, will be with Rob Wilson and Milton Reynolds. And we'll be showing a clip of a brand new documentary called Surviving Eugenics, which is about the the history and the ongoing significance of um, 20th century eugenic sterilization programs in Western Canada, something that we really haven't heard much about, at least in the United States. Um, and the, uh, uh, the documentary has stories, narratives by survivors, people who were sterilized under those state programs. And uh, Rob is one of the uh, filmmakers, and Milton Reynolds, who will be in conversation with him, uh, works with the wonderful organization Facing History and Ourselves. So that's coming up on Thursday, November 19th, our next Talking Biopolitics conversation. So I wanted to just say a couple of words about the Center for Genetics and Society, our mission statement. Um, we, as many of you know, we work on um, human genetic and reproductive technologies, and we bring to them a perspective that's grounded in social justice and human rights values, along with those others that you see. And what we do, um, we have a range of activities, uh, approaches to the work, and many of you have um, joined us in some of these activities, and we invite others of you to do so. So starting at the top, we really do want to put a lot of effort into building a network of concerned people, um, advocates, scholars, and others who share our perspective, generally speaking, on human genetic and assisted reproductive technologies. Moving to the right, we intervene in policy uh, uh, decisions when uh, the opportunities present themselves. And um, right now, one of our key focuses is on human germline gene editing, which many of you have heard about. At the bottom, advocacy-oriented research, we um, try to select questions that haven't been well-researched and uh, take a look, deeper look at those to uh, Find, make findings that we can use in our advocacy and on our awareness building, and that brings us to the last approach, strategic communications. So we do put a lot of effort into our own writing of op-eds and commentaries, our blog, our website, our social media, and uh, also to talking with the media about um, the, the work that we do and the perspective that we have. 
So that's something about the Center for Genetics and Society. And we'll be sending, after this um, conversation, to all of you who are participating, we'll be sending an email with um, links to the information that we that I just gave and a little more that we'll be giving later, links to George's and uh, Lisa's um, website pages. And um, we invite you to, to explore, to join us, and to, to be involved. We would really appreciate that. So I think now it's time for us to get started. And I can now introduce our presenters. And so George and Lisa, would you now start sharing your webcams and unmute your microphones? Just a couple of clicks away. Great. Hi, George. And great. And Lisa, let's get you on as well. Great. OK, so I think we're connected by video and by audio. And let me tell everyone who you are. Um, George Annis is a professor in multiple schools, the schools of public health, School of Medicine and the School of Law at Boston University, and he's the director of the Public Health School Center of Health, Law, Ethics, and Human Rights. And in addition to um, his academic positions, he's got advocacy positions. He's the founder of the organization Global Lawyers and Physicians. And um, his research and writing has focused on health, on human rights, on uh, the rights of patients, the regulation of research on human subjects, and his most recent book, in addition to genomic messages, are Worst Case Bioethics, Death, Disaster, and Public Health, and American Bioethics, Crossing Human Rights and Health Law Boundaries. And that's just the case. There are a bunch of other books as well. Welcome, George. Um, Lisa Ikamoto yeah, um, is a professor at the UC Davis, University of California Davis School of Law. And also, I'm very happy to say, she's been serving as a fellow at the Center for Genetics and Society. Her research areas include reproductive and genetic technology uses and healthcare disparities and also public health law. More specifically, she focused on the ways that race and gender mediate access to and impacts of biomedical technology use in healthcare. And she's done a lot of really innovative and wonderful work, most recently addressing uh, reproductive tourism, the ways in which human gamete use links the fertility industry and the biotechnology industry and the privatizing effects of informed consent. So I uh, welcome both of you. I thank both of you. And I'll let you take it from here. Thanks. Marcy. Hi. Hi, George. Hi, Lisa. And welcome, everybody, to the conversation. I'm going to start right in so we can make the most of our time uh, together today since it's relatively short. So I want to start with a pretty broad question. You and Dr. Sherman Elias had a collaboration that continued for years and years, um, and did many projects together. I'm sorry, sorry to hear about his death. Um, my first question is, why did you two write this book at this time? Well, it's a fair question. Uh, Sherman and I have been working together for more than 30 years, and had written primarily for the medical and scientific literature. And we were pretty good at that, but uh, we had the feeling that the message wasn't really getting out to the public and that the public really needed to know some concrete details and policy options for the new genetics that the time was coming fast when they were actually going to start hearing about the new genetics from their physician or from their friends. And so we thought the time was right. And we also found it challenging to write a book for the public, which we've never done before. So both for our own intellectual curiosity, whether we could do it, but more important, uh, that we thought this was an issue that should be democratized and that the public should be taking a, a major role in uh, and really wasn't equipped to it. Uh, we hope this book would help equip them to engage in the discussion. Sure. Can you speak up just a little? Sure. Okay. Is that, is that better? Um, I hope I you're the only one who can hear. <laughs> We worked on this earlier, but we're still working. We're still uh, fixing it. Um, so I want to follow up on a classic. In the first part of the book, um, you address and debunk a lot of the hype around genomics. Um, what part of the myth or genomic hype do you think are most misleading? What What were your sort of primary targets? Well, I think the primary target with genomics is that everything begins and ends with genes, and that if you understand uh, your genetics, you'll know 
what diseases you're going to get, what your future is going to be like, what your children are going to be like, and uh, that literally is a myth. Right? Genes are very important, but they can't act, can't do anything all by themselves. And it's not just genes and environment; it's genes, environment, lifestyle, the microbiome, etc. So I guess our major myth we wanted to debunk was that genes are deterministic; that they tell you what your life is going to be like and what you know, diseases you're going to get. And, uh, and your children, and uh, that essentially life is complicated, and the genome is going to add to that complexity more than it's going to uh, simplify it. I thought it was interesting that early in the book you criticized the use of the terms um, personalized medicine and precision medicine, um, and yet we have the NIH launching this major initiative, um, the Precision Medicine Initiative with a strong endorsement of, of President Obama. And I was wondering if you could flag any issues that we should be thinking about. Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the Precision Medicine Program is Obama's kind of signature presidential uh, scientific advance, I guess. He might put the brain initiative in there, too, although that, that's at its very beginning. Uh, but what to call it has baffled people for the last 20 years. And the insiders like the, like the phrase personalized medicine. That makes it seem like uh, very American. We're doing something just for you. As it's, it's going to be like personalized, uh, is seem to be good, right? Uh, precision medicine, I actually don't think it's going to last. I mean, that's kind of like everything's precision if you listen to TV ads. The precision cars, precision, uh, uh, you know, precision, med and precision foods, precision everything. Uh, and the term we, we like to, and I think it's the right term, is just genomic medicine. It's whenever you use genomic information uh, to determine what drug to prescribe, what, uh, what procedure to make, what preventive me method to use. And we think that just simple description is better than trying to use uh, words as basically as uh, arguments or advertising for the, for the endeavor. You know, at some point in the book, you also introduce the term stratified. Um, medicine. Could you sure. explain I mean, that? In reality, I mean, we can, we contrast that. I mean, personalized medicine kind of brings the image that you're going to make a drug just for this individual person. And, and we know that's not true. We can, you know, can barely afford to make drugs for uh, orphan diseases, let alone for individual people. But what genomic medicine will be at some, at some point is stratified medicine in the sense that there will be groups of people, large groups of people, who will share certain genetic characteristics. And those genetic characteristics may become the target of uh, medical or public health intervention. And that, that stratified is kind of the, the term for that. I think it's the right term. That there will be various strata of people, and you know, depending which strata you're on, which series of genes you have, may depend your treatment. That's as good as genomic medicine is ever going to get. So you flagged the concern that we're placing too much emphasis on the role of genomics um, and the role of genetics as individuals as well. Um, and again, you know, we have this sort of major federal initiative on genomic medicine. Um, will that project help get us to taking more seriously the role of environmental and other contributors um, to health and illness? Boy, you can be very hopeful. Uh, it could. It actually could. I mean, because the uh, one nice thing about the president's proposal, it hasn't started yet, but they're getting ready to start letting Americans volunteer for this in, in two to three years, uh, is that they plan from the beginning not just to do the genome, not just to do your medical records, not just to do your family history, but also to do a careful look at your environment and your lifestyle. So it's uh, multifactorial. They recognize from the outset, this is not all about genes. Genes have a role, an important role, but it's only one of five areas that they're going to look at with this panel of one million Americans. And the other good thing about it, I and mean, one of the things, reason Sherman and I wrote the book as well, is we believe that the way genomics is treated in medicine in terms of informed consent and privacy is going to be a way that virtually all medicine is going to go in terms of informed consent and privacy. And since we're both strong advocates of both of those concepts, um, we think, uh, and we take a strong position, that 
we have to hold the line at getting informed consent for all genetic uh, collections and interventions and maintaining privacy of individuals that genomic information as well as their medical information. And to that extent, uh, so far with the September 17th report from the uh, President's Precision Medicine proposal, they are planning to take informed consent and privacy both very, very seriously, which I'm sure much to the consternation of many people with existing uh, biobanks today. Can you talk a little bit about the, do you know, are you familiar with the form of informed consent? You spent a lot of time in your book talking about sort of different models of informed consent. You're a very strong proponent of individualized, specific informed consent. You come from a place of a very strong autonomy principle. Um, do you think that the form of informed consent that they're considering is adequate? Uh, well, it's hard to know. I mean, they, they haven't really given details about it except to say that it is going to be individualized and people are not going to be able to, or they actually they have the option if they want to, give so-called broad consent, consent to any use of my DNA forever. I mean, we think that is not, that's just like waiving consent. That's not informed consent. That's uninformed waiver of consent. Uh, so in this regard, it's very interesting that uh, the uh, new proposals to change existing research rules in the United States across the board, uh, which just came out a couple of weeks ago as well, September 8th, looked like they were designed hand in hand with the president's proposal in that they, uh, you know, they talk about simplifying informed consent, uh, certainly getting away from the 60 page consent forms we have now to try to get the essence of the, the individual risks and benefits down to one page, which I think makes a lot of sense. And I hope that that's done in both projects. Uh, and also talk about something I, which I, I actually don't agree with, which is treating biospecimens, like your DNA or your blood, as human research subjects. Which they're not, obviously. They're related to human research subjects. They're related to you. But ultimately, it seems to me, we're going to have to have a, a whole separate set of regulatory apparatus to deal with biospecimen banks, uh, which are not, just don't do human subjects research. They do research on biospecimens taken from human subjects. It's no more human subjects research than medical records research is human subjects research. And I don't believe IRBs have any business overseeing uh, the genome banks. They don't know anything about it, number one. And number two, why should they? They don't involve human subjects. So we have a lot, we have a lot of work to do yet before we get this right. So they're going to try to create a million person biobank as part of this initiative. What should the first step be? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part so, of it. Part of the initiative involves creating a million person biobank, as right. I understand. And then what should the first steps be? Well, I mean, they're talking right. They say we don't want to start collecting biospecimens until we have the central repository built. We're ready to take the samples and we know exactly what we want to tell everybody. Because we can't, you don't really want to go back and, and, you know, reinvent the thing, have new consent forms, new procedures, etc. So that's the way it should be done. You shouldn't start collecting samples until, uh, you have all, not just your rules in place, but your, your biobank in place as well. And they're going to be collecting blood samples. And that's good to have agreement on that too, as opposed to saliva samples and a lot of other banks have collected uh, in, in the past. The most interesting thing, from my perspective, uh, about the bank, the, the million person bank, is that it's going to be made up entirely of volunteers, and they want a system where any American can volunteer for this. Now, I don't know if that's because they don't expect more than a million people to volunteer, or they want there to be some kind of a contest, I'm not sure. And then maybe, uh, but whatever, that's right, it should all be voluntary, and to start out with volunteers, makes perfect sense to me. On the other hand, they want to make sure it's not all nice white middle class people. I mean, they want it to be diverse. They want to have it representative of the population uh, in terms of minority uh, representation. And uh, I think that's right, too. All right. I want to um, ask you a little bit about the, um, you have three chapters on repro genetics, or repro genomics. Um, one addresses the assisted reproductive reproductive technology use. You have one on prenatal screening and diagnosis, and one on the screening and testing of children. Um, and as I mentioned before, throughout the book, you advocate, I think, very consistently for very robust 
individualized form of informed consent. But with these, these areas, you're really talking about parental consent, right? Not individual informed consent. And some of the testing and screening um, technologies that are becoming available really raise questions about the limits um, of parental consent or whether or not there should be limits on parental consent. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, sure. Now, that's a pretty broad question, but let's look at uh, what a lot of people are starting to talk about now, and I hope not seriously, which is doing whole genome screening of newborns. Yeah. I mean, that's a, a great question. Uh, historically, uh, newborn screening has been a matter of state law, and parents don't even have any choice about it. But certainly, if we're going to look at, even consider uh, whole genome screening of newborns, uh, first, it shouldn't be required by the state. It should not be a, a rule that everybody has to get their whole genome screened uh, to become a citizen of the United States or, or to be born here. Uh, the harder question is whether parents should even be able to consent to have a whole genome screening done on their, on their infant. And my bet on that is, uh, I think make, more or less make this argument, is that they should. Is that it can only do the newborn harm. We don't have any research on this yet, uh, but my guess is when we do, if we do, and one project is going on now, we're going to see parents treat their kids differently based on their genome, even especially based on diseases that their genetics predisposes them to. It's not none of it's deterministic, but let's say they have a higher risk of Alzheimer's than uh, the quote normal population. Uh, will parents start from <laughs> one year old? treating their kid differently because uh, when they're 70 they might get Alzheimer's disease or breast cancer or even a real disease like cystic fibrosis which you could get young. Um, again, I think that here genomics could actually cause more harm than good and we want to be very slow and very careful about applying it immediately just because it's cheap to do. You know, for the last 10 years we've been talking about the thousand dollar genome, and won't it be wonderful once we can do a genome for a thousand dollars? No, not necessarily. It's not just about the money, it's about what good you can do. And scientists lately more and more talk about the five dollar elephant, and I like that, uh, which is would you, would you buy an elephant for five dollars? And the answer is no, because it would cost you hundreds of thousands to keep this elephant and feed it and house it. So just the price alone doesn't tell you you want to use genomics to do uh, your whole genome or uh, your child's whole genome. You've got to know what you want to do it for and whether that goal can be attained without causing more problems. So that's, and that's where we are now. We're just barely starting about uh, to talk about genomic screening of, of the newborn. Now the next question is very closely related obviously is genomic screening of fetuses. And unlike children, we're not going to kill the children even if they got horrible genes. Uh, with fetuses, we have a history of uh, terminating pregnancy for serious genetic uh, disorders. And the question that's raised, and I don't have an answer for it, I, I don't know uh, how we're going to answer it. And, and Sherman and I have been working on this for 15 years, and we haven't been able to define serious genetic disorders uh, to the extent that we would agree that you should be able to screen your fetus for serious genetic disorders. We disagree on what those are. Uh, we almost all agree that Down syndrome is one of them, although there's a whole anti-Down syndrome screening movement starting out there as well. And I certainly respect that. Uh, so just to flag that, that, that's a very hard question. And the default in the United States is to say, well, let not the parents decide. And I don't think that's right either. I think that there actually uh, should be a standard agreed upon set of, uh, of uh, anomalies or disorders that you get. We might, we, the society as a general would say, well, that makes sense, that's reasonable. But there are you know, many things, like I think all late onset disorders, that should not be screened for in fetus. That can only be used against the fetus in ways that don't make any sense, because it's almost always, from the fetus's point of view, and from the parent's point of view, better to have that child with a possibility of getting a late onset disease, um, probably after the parents are dead, but they'll never know about it than it is to uh, terminate that pregnancy and look for, quote, a better baby. There's, there's no such thing as a genetically perfect baby. <laughs> that's, a, that's a futile search if you're trying to find a baby without any problems. There's no such thing as perfect children. Or a fetus without any problems. So, so. 
So those are closely related, how it's seen the fetus and how it's seen the Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think you raise a really difficult um, point is that the tendency in the U.S. tends to say, tends to be let the parents decide. To some extent, that's a market approach. And you made the point in your book that maybe one of the things you and most of us did not fully anticipate was the role of commercialization um, on biotechnologies and the way it makes things available without much filter. No, I think that's correct. I think, I mean, we knew that we're a commercial society, a market-driven society, but no, we did not anticipate how, you know, the smartphone and uh, the internet uh, and direct-to-consumer advertising and delivery uh, would kind of take over the, the scientific and medical universe uh, almost immediately. And it really has. And it's, uh, it's a major challenge for the Food and Drug Administration, for a professional association, uh, to have any say at all in what's done on the Internet, what, what things are advertised to, uh, to people, and uh, what limits, if any, we can put on what people can buy. And outside, we don't even do well with illegal drugs. So. Obviously, legal drugs, the legal tests, much, much harder to regulate. And so better if we can have a societal well, a agreement on what things we think make sense and what things, in other words, what things we'll buy and what things we won't buy. What things are just bogus and are going to make our lives more miserable. Uh, or, you know, make oil. And what things really can help us make reasonable medical decisions for ourselves and our family. That's a big moving target. Yeah. Definitely. I want to, um, <laughs> each of your questions I want to continue talking about, but I also want to touch on some other points in your book. <laughs> We're running out of minutes to do that. Um, so I want to ask you a little bit about um, genomic privacy. In the chapter on genomic privacy, you, sh you say that we should all be privacy tigers. Um, and you make it clear that the reference to tiger, the use of the term tiger, comes from an approach that Google considered um, that would have allowed individual users to choose a level of privacy protection. You used the, I guess the terms kittens, cats, and tigers were used. And yeah, that's exactly what they were. Yeah. For the tiger position. So what? why should we all be so fierce? Well, I think that uh, we're all figuring that out, that, that all our information is hackable. We know that even the CIA can't keep its information away from hackers, which is pretty amazing. Um, Google has so far decided that they're not going to use the highest strength, uh, uh, protection of our private information. Apple decided they are, you know, who knows whether all that type as well. But you know, two or three years ago, even the bioethicists were saying privacy is dead. We should get over it. We should stop trying to protect it. It's not. Uh, that view has radically changed. I think Snowden had a big impact on that. Most people uh, don't want to share their information with everybody. They may want to share it with their Facebook friends, so-called, or their family. But they absolutely, totally don't want the government to have their information, the employer to have their information, the school to have their information, or their friends to have that information. They want medical genetic information to be private and to stay private, up to them whether they share it or not. And I think, yes, I think we should all take that position um, because we're stronger together on that. Well, so here's the point. Do you, I, it seems like you you express some support for at least some forms of big data um, genomic work, um, and that seems like maybe that's the biggest threat to genomic privacy. Well, I think we may need new. I mean, this is a President Obama's proposal too that we may need new ways to protect genomic privacy in, in database. Yeah. Uh, again, one group says we can't do it. George Church's group, uh, basically a thousand genome project. Uh, has told the people, we can't guarantee that we're going to be able to protect your privacy. Of course, nobody can guarantee that. But you can do better or worse, right? You can encrypt all the information, and you can take steps to keep it in one bank, that's the president's policy, not share it with any other bank. Uh, there are technological ways to protect privacy. We may not have invented it yet, but uh, if we put half the effort we put in uh, sharing information into developing good privacy technology, it can be done. And the, the, it's the, uh, the computer guys that tell me this can be done. And I believe them. I believe. But we have to take it seriously. You've got to want to do it. If you don't want to do it, then every penny you spend on it is too much. Right? So, so, but I think Americans do take it seriously. That's my main point. 
and they want their government to take it seriously. And I think the government is taking it seriously now, too. So all we got left is private industry, and I think they're mixed on it. All right, I'm going to take my uh, uh, prerogative and ask you one more question, then I, I was really fascinated by the chapter on the future. Um, so I want to ask you a question by that, and then it looks like we have a long queue of questions, and I want to turn over to those Great. in just a couple of minutes. But um, CRISPR. Um, so as of a couple of years ago, CRISPR-Cas9 was introduced as a new genetic modification technology, and potentially the big controversy is that it could be used to genetically modify humans, or at least embryos. Um, so maybe as an opening question, what I wanted to ask you is in earlier debates about genetic modification, the distinction between therapeutic and non-therapeutic modification has been used to define the line between per permissible and impermissible modifications. Do you think that's useful here? Well, I actually don't think it's useful here. I think that if you have an embryo that has a serious genetic disease, as we talked about before, that uh, you shouldn't use that embryo to reproduce. That uh, you should, you know, trying to fix that genetic problem is, number one, just as likely to create a new problem as, 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 as not, and actually the risks, I think, of that to the future child are so great as to say you can't really, shouldn't really be able to experiment on that embryo in this way. So I would say to the, to the couple, which is Matt, and who am I to say this to them, but I will, uh, they should use their non-affected embryos. If they don't have any non-affected embryos, then we're back to the uh, assisted reproductive technologies of donor egg and donor sperm. And then what about the line between research modification and reproductive modification? Well, research is a fancy term for uh, cellular uh, or a, a, a non-reproductive use. I mean, there's two ways to, to use uh, the ge genomics at that stage to make stem cells. One is uh, to, uh, to use the embryo to make a baby, and the other is to use the embryo to make more cells. And I think it's fine. I, I, you know, who am I to determine? And I thought it was fine to use human embryos to make cells to make medicine. Uh, when we both thought it was very problematic to use modified human embryos or cloning to make a child. So that's the distinction. It's you know, making medicine versus making a baby. Okay, I get one more question then. Um, okay. I wanna, you, you talked about a Silomar. So 1975, scientists for one of the very few times, as you point out, called for a moratorium on recombinant DNA um, research. And I wonder, do you think a Silomar has any lessons for us today? I mean, I do. I mean, the question, the real question is, uh, does CRISPR provide another opportunity for another Acilomar? If we did another one, it wouldn't just be scientists. I mean, there were four attorneys involved in that one, too, but it's got to be much more representative of the public. I right? think the days are gone when the scientists can make their own rules. And they know that, and some of them resent it, and some of them think it's just right. You know, so, um, but I think we have to democratize these decisions at this point. That CRISPR is much more powerful than even recombinant DNA technology. And uh, yeah, and that's the lesson from Acelema is sunshine matters and you've got to let the public know what's going on uh, in science uh, because sometimes they can, get, they can get carried away without recognizing it themselves. And I, I do not expect scientists to regulate themselves. I don't think you should. That's not their social role. Other people have to regulate themselves. The government, private, private people, and the public who's going to be the subject of their research. I'll have to play a part in regulating science. All right. Um, I think we're going to take a brief pause now um, and then switch screens and move to a more open discussion. Right. This is great, and I'm really eager to, <laughs> to hear this go on and to bring in the questions and comments from the participants. and. Um, so uh, please, to all of you who are listening, um, do submit your comments and questions. We have um, some already, and we'll hope that we can get through at least many of them. Um, but this pause will allow um, Lisa to take a look at the questions that have been submitted, and it allows me to um, both thank you once more, Lisa and George, and also to tell you a little bit about additional information um, that's available. So again, we'll be sending this all to you in an email following up afterwards, but um, uh, we wanted to just alert you to the fact that you can find out a lot more about George's work on his website, 
Um, these are live links, but, and again, we'll be sending them to you. Also uh, about his book, um, which we, I, you know, what's really amazing is that it's a book for a lay audience, but there's a way in which all of us are a lay audience at this point because these things are so new and um, raise so many questions. Um, we'll also be sending you a, a link to Lisa Ikamoto's website, and there's, uh, her CV is full of amazing articles that are really uh, essential for understanding the developments in, um, on these issues. Um, at the Center for Genetics and Society website, we have a wealth of information, news articles, commentaries, and we'll be sending you links to special sections of the website on personal genomics and on sequencing and genomics. Um, we also wanted to let you know that there are a lot of ways that you can stay involved with the Center for Genetics and Society. Um, of course, we would be very, very appreciative of any monetary contributions that you um, can make and that will help us with all our activities, including Talking Biopolitics, the program there. And we wanted to note um, and flag, for those of you who are in the Bay Area, we started just uh, last couple weeks ago a new film series um, on the UC Berkeley campus that we're calling Being Human in a Biotech Age. So last week we showed the film Fix, the science slash fiction of human enhancement. And next week on Tuesday at 4 o'clock, uh, Tuesday, October 13th, we're going to be showing, screening the film Made in India, which is about cross-border surrogacy in India. And the filmmakers, Vaishali Sinha and Rebecca uh, Himowitz, will be joining us there by Skype afterwards for, for discussion. So that's a, an in-person, a, virtu uh, a non-virtual event on the UC Berkeley campus. And um, just to uh, uh, complete this little pause here, we invite you also, for those of you who haven't, to sign up for our newsletter, which compiles a lot of commentary and uh, news articles and will show up in your inbox every other week, and to follow CGS on Twitter and Facebook, and to visit the CGS website and blog. So we would really would value your ongoing participation. So okay, um, we do have a long list of questions there, so Lisa, I'm going to turn it back over to you to figure out which ones uh, uh, and see how many we can get through, and George and Lisa uh, will go just until the top of the hour. and. Thanks to all of you for participating. Um, okay, I have um, a request. When you um, submit a question, you have to keep it succinct because I can't read them. Um, I can't read the long ones. Um, so if there's at least one very long question, and if that could be resubmit resubmitted in a much shorter form, I can get to it. Thank you. All right, so first question, if I can open it. Here we go. All right, I'm having technical difficulties now. All right, here's a question, George. Okay. Um, how do you believe the precipitous drop in the cost of sequencing effects? Um, whether, how do you think the drop, the drop in the cost of sequencing affects whether or not there's an ethical imperative for people who are, quote, reproductive risk, close quote, so in other words, of reproductive age, to obtain sequencing in the best interest of their potential future child. Does that make sense the way I said it? Yeah, I'm, uh, I think I've already uh, hinted that uh, I think that sequencing can create as many problems as it solves with probably more. I certainly don't think there's any uh, ethical imperative to be screened um, on, on behalf of your, your future children. Um, no, I don't, I don't see that any more than there's an ethical imperative to screen fetuses. You can be screened if you want to be screened, uh, but you should have informed consent before that. You should be told that we're likely to find a lot of things in your genome that there's nothing we can do about it, and uh, nothing we can tell you, uh, except not to have children if you're really afraid of it. But uh, that's, uh, that's a decision I think you can make and should make without having your genome uh, sequenced. Uh, the price should, should matter, again, but the price is not is not the big issue. It will matter for some people, but the uh, question is not what, not how much it costs, but whether it's worthwhile, whether it can actually make your life better. All right. This is, this is a different question from a di sort of on a different thread, and it's a question I wanted to ask myself. You touch on sort of our history of eugenics in the United States, and the question is, to what extent does the lack of historical knowledge about the past 
embrace of eugenic ideology in the United States contribute to the enthusiasm for these emerging technologies? Oh, I think a lot. I think, uh, you know, Americans don't know history and people don't care about history. I was talking to my freshman class the other day, they, in, uh, and they don't remember 9-11. They didn't make any, or the Iraq war, they made no, or Abu Ghraib, it made no sense to them. They didn't know what we're talking about. So yeah, uh, our history of eugenics is a horrible, and, uh, and it could be coming back, and mostly the uh, current geneticists will say, oh, that, that was, that's irrelevant. That was Hitler, that was not American. Actually, it was American, and uh, we don't want to face our history, but we have to face our history if we're going to do this. Absolutely, totally. Because whatever you want to think about genomics, I don't think you should be using it to make a superior baby or worth than that, a superior group of people or a superior race. That's kind of the last thing we want to do is go down that road again. But we will if we don't face do our own history. What do you think will look like this time if it occurs? Well, I mean, the argument is that uh, the big difference, it won't be government mandated anymore. It'll be consumer driven. Will, the people will volunteer for it. I actually don't think that makes it any better. It's going to be just as bad for the people involved, uh, whether their, quote, superior race has been uh, designed by willing consumers or by the government. Um, I have a question. It's going to make all our lives worse because it's going to increase inequality. It's probably the worst surge we have in our lives. So a question, what is the science behind Ancestry.com's genomic messages about race, ethnicity, family, and nationality? I don't know. Is there well, science? Well, you should be asking uh, my colleague, Chairman Elias, that. I, I, don't, I don't even want to comment okay. on that. I, but uh, it, it, it's more, uh, uh, no, I mean, I'm not going to comment on that. I'll leave that one. I'll leave the science alone. All right. Well, you do talk about uh, genetic, ra genetic and race, genetics and race, um, in your book. Maybe you could tie it into yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no gene for race. I think everybody knows that. Uh, you know, the uh, you know, the genetic diversity within races is much more varied than genetic diversity between so-called races. Uh, uh, so, if you're interested in race, uh, that's a social construct. Everybody admits that. Uh, that you should be looking at your preconception. Don't don't be looking at genes. Genes aren't going to help. You. I wish everybody would hear that. Um, oh, here's a question about the common rule and the proposed changes to it. Are you familiar with the proposed rule changes to the common rule? Um, and if so, do you think they improve consent slash privacy procedures for research participant biospecimen storage? And I think to some extent you addressed this. Um, already, but I want to see if you had any more to say about it. We spent a lot of time. Well, I think the consent, consent rules are, are, are better. You know, I, uh, my personal opinion is we should do away with consent forms altogether and just videotape the process and stop obsessing about what words we put on the form. Uh, in terms of privacy, I think we have to wait and see. Uh, I don't, again, I don't think biospecimens are human subjects. I don't think, think the risks of privacy are different than the risks of bodily integrity and uh, physical risk, and that IRBs should not be the ones in charge of biobanks. But I'm definitely in the minority okay. there. Wait, and then can I follow up with that? You said about videotaping the informed consent process, and then um, sure. what would that add? That's one, that's, that's one nice thing I think technology has, has helped us. It's videotaping used to be a major undertaking, with big machines and stuff. Now you can do it on your iPhone or Google Glass or or any number of ways of paying with it's nothing. It's totally not intrusive. And we've been saying forever, informed consent is not a form. It's a process. And that's right. But the only way people are going to believe that is if you get rid of the form altogether and do the process of talking to the person, sharing information, and then having the person come to a decision or not come to a decision. And you, you videotape it, not because you're going to look at all the videotapes, but you could if you wanted to go back and uh, you know, do a random sample of it to see how people were doing. Um, oh, this is a question about 23andMe. 23andMe is hiring 25 scientists for drug development in the next year. Is it too early to create pharma solutions for genomic messages? Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, 23, and this may have always been their business model. I have no insight into it, but a uh, company that I 
debated for years in Iceland. That was their business model. They're going to collect DNA from hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people and then use that DNA to do drug research to try to find correlations between diseases and genes and then try to come up with it with a drug. So one thing 23andMe did was collect a large data bank of DNA samples from their members. Uh, and uh, and now they're selling them. They're selling access to them. That's a pretty interesting business model. Whether they're going to want, whether the drug companies are making a good investment or a bad investment remains to be seen. Uh, I don't think, well, I don't know. But yeah, but that we have to wait. But that's a totally different thing than direct to consumer genomics, which is trying to tell something to the individual. This is trying to sell something to pharmaceutical companies. Oh, there's a question, and I'm not sure I get the full gist of it because it was one of the long questions, so I wasn't able to read the whole thing. Um, but there's a question about mitochondrial um, manipulation technologies. Uh, maybe okay. you could just comment on those technologies. What's your view on that? Well, uh, number one, to the extent that they're used, there's a very tiny group of people who it's going to, uh, it's going to affect. There are not that many people with mitochondrial. Uh, diseases, thankfully. Uh, and so it follows the model that U.S. and European drug companies have now adopted, which is to try to find cures for diseases that only a few people have and then charge them a million dollars for a pill or whatever. This is not a pill, this is a technique. So first of all, I think that that's a bad model, that we should be looking at diseases that millions of people have, not that uh, tens or hundreds of people have. Uh, the second argument against them, the mitochondrial DNA manipulation or replacing my, the mitochondria in, a, in, a, in an embryo or an egg is that it could it crosses a line because it's some there's 23 or so genes in uh, in the mitochondria, mitochondrial DNA, and uh, this would be germline genetic work, and that we should never cross that line, and that's been argued about for 30 or 40 years, yeah. and most people have said that. That's a bright line, but it doesn't really make any sense at some level. Um, versus the one you mentioned before, the difference between therapy uh, and enhancement. Right? But that's a that's a line that, that is not a bright line at all, right? and that's one you probably can't use for regulation because you can't tell really what the difference is, whether it's eyeglasses or, or anything else, whether those are enhancements or, or uh, therapeutics. So. My view is that this deserves a lot more public attention before we make a decision on it. England's already made a decision to go ahead and do research on it. Uh, I think you have to accept their procedure and let them do some research and they will learn something. The United States is nowhere near that. We haven't had a public discussion. We haven't had a vote from a public agency yet. And uh, I don't think uh, the FDA is right just to look at the science yeah, that they're looking at it now. I think we need a broad discussion of the ethics. And we just haven't had it yet. So we come down very strongly in the middle in the book for more more discussion before we go ahead and do it. But we're not against it per se. Okay. Um, this is a question when we talk about the sort of a follow up to the our conversation about the role of commercialization. Um, how how might we best challenge the market driven incentives that seem to be drivers of these technologies? Um, it's almost as if as though markets are being created by the hype rather than the technologies responding to the needs. Well, that's exactly what it is. I mean, that's what advertising is. Right? It starts to create uh, create a need that doesn't exist. <laughs> Make you think you have to have whatever it is they're trying to sell. And the real question is, is the market model and that advertising model appropriate for medicine and science? And uh, I think the answer to that is no. but. So far, we've answered, you know, we're like the only country in the world, I think there's one other one, that lets pharmaceutical companies advertise on television, for example. We think those are educational ads, according to the Food and Drug Administration. Well, you tell me what, what you've learned by listening to ads for Cialis or Viagra, or uh, we're going to start having the so-called female uh, sexual desire pill, Abby, next month. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that's just the wrong way to go. but. We are. We have to recognize we're in the middle of a market-driven medical uh, market, and changing that's going to be hard. The only way the only way you can resist that is not to buy their product. 
Hmm. The only way to tell us have any voice. Uh, and then the next step you could go to, if you really were upset about it, is to organize boycott. But, but that's it. We love advertising. It pays for all our media. We've been trying to figure out now how to advertise on, on uh, you know, Facebook or Twitter and uh, the internet. And how is it, you know? So that's a really hard problem. I don't say that's a hard problem. Yeah. But, but you have to recognize if they have to advertise it, it's not something you need. You needed it. Your physician would know about it. Your, your medical care provider would know about it. Other people would know about it. You wouldn't have to get it from the television. So it's sort of a bleak view. <laughs> well, I think it's realistic. <laughs> well, I, like, I guess I wonder I if you, you call for democratization of science um, and for more public engagement over the technology uses, and I wonder if that has a role in countering. Um, the commercialization effect. Well, it's possible, right? Right now, the only people putting out so-called uh, statements of ethics are the industry. It's a pretty good, they get together a group of people and they meet somewhere and they call it the Hinkson statement or whatever, and say this represents uh, ethics. When really, what it represents is industry view of what ethics should be, mm -hmm. which is that leave us alone and we'll we'll give you something nice when we're all done. Uh, so yeah, uh, I mean the public's got to want to be engaged too. Yeah. Yeah. We have a pretty disengaged public right now on just about everything, including electing a president. I mean, um, it's really, really difficult. I and mean, that's what this organization does. It sponsors our talk to try to engage the public in genetic issues. And uh, it's a real challenge. Yeah, and I think we have to recognize it, it is a real challenge. Not, yeah. not everybody uh, wants to talk about these things. You must have some optimistic view because you wrote the book. Right, aimed at the public. Sure. Well, I think that uh, it, it's impossible to get the public uh, involved if they don't have some sources of information. I think we're the only source that they can go to to get balanced, unbiased information. And the most, the, the thing that pleased me the most about uh, the response to the book is the number of people who have said, and scientists as well, that it's a very balanced book. Uh, and that they really don't do present both sides uh, of, uh, of these major issues. And, and I think that's true. I think that's a tribute to Sherman. I'm not as talented as he is, and he was. You know, he spent a lifetime being a uh, first-class obstetrician geneticist, so he dealt with patients in these situations literally every day. Uh, so he was terrific at that, and uh, terrific at you know, trying to get the patient informed enough to make their own their own decision. And that's you know one of the roles of, of this book as well. And you're right, I must have some optimism if I <laughs> spend time writing it to expect some people to read it and at least some people to appreciate exactly. all of it. Yes, you're right. Um, let's see, I have another question. You speak about the benefits of pharmaco pharmacogenomics in your book. Um, is there an overuse of DNA tests in psychiatric diagnoses currently? I, you know, the, the evidence of, uh, of DNA linked to psychiatric uh, Conditions is, is very weak. I, I think it, it, you know, whether it exists or not. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think we're anywhere near being able to use uh, genomic information to make quote a psychiatric diagnosis. That's a much more complex uh, thing than just your genes. It's obviously, I think no one would dispute this. But at the very least, your genes and your environment. And the environment is at least as important, if not more important, than your genes. You know, is the um. Is the NIH Precision um, Medicine Initiative hoping to learn any more about that? Well, they're you know they're hoping to learn more about everything. Yes, that's uh, yeah, genetic. Yeah, that's, that's one of their that's one of their issues. Sure. Yeah, although it's not high, there actually is a page in that report. I'm sorry, I didn't. I can't recall it right off. Where they list uh, about 20 things that they're primarily looking for. I just don't remember. But anybody could go to that the September 17th Precision Medicine report and find that page and see what they're looking for. Yeah. All right. And um, I'm not going to start looking for at least three to four years. So. <laughs> we got time to figure that one out. Hopefully. It'll go, pa it'll go quickly, though. Um, it does. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's amazing how fast it goes. Yeah. 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 And there's a, lot of there's a lot of work to be done before then. Yeah, well, 15 years ago, we got so-called announced the sequencing of the human genome. Right? 
15 years ago. I know. Because that at that time, President Clinton said, in 15 years, we'll I'll solve cancer. I don't think so. Yeah, that, didn't, that hasn't happened yet. Oh. All right. What would you tell parents who want to screen their child for BRCA1 and BRCA2 because they strongly believe that it is in the child's best interest? Um, do parents have the right to make decisions that is in their child's best interest? Yeah, well, those are two different questions. Interest. Parents do have the right to make decisions in their child's best interest, but I would argue it's never in their child's best interest for it to be screened for a disease like breast cancer that's not going to get at least until it's 30. Uh, and that we wait till the child is 18 at least, and unless the child makes a decision, it's not a child anymore. So if, if, he, if she wants to be screened, that's a decision I, I don't think parents should be able to make. But they will be unless doctors refuse to do the test. And that would be a whole new thing. But I think it's time for physicians to put limits on what testing they will do on children at the behest of parents who would just have this kind of free flowing anxiety that something horrible could happen to their children. And where's the motivation for physicians to do that going to come from? Well, it's going to have to come from professional standards. And this is a big problem, both with lawyers, I'm a lawyer, and with physicians. Because both professions have become businesses. Uh, it's not just that we've commercialized drugs and devices, we've commercialized medicine and the practice of medicine. And that's not in anybody's best interest. Uh, I think the public needs an independent uh, medical profession and the medical profession is not a profession, it's a trade, uh, unless uh, it has rules and standards of ethics, creates them and follows them. And one of them should be we don't do things that are not in the best interest of our patients, period, including our children. So you want I, I know it's hard, I know it's hard to resist yeah, parental demand, but they got to do it. Otherwise, you're, again, you're not a physician anymore. You have to, uh, it's like a merchant who's selling something, and we'll just give it to you if you pay for it. So, George, you're swimming against the tide. <laughs> <laughs> you want to see that? Yeah, that's, that's okay. That's my job. <laughs> swimming against the tide with optimism. <laughs> we are. Okay, right. I, 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 I have to quote Marsha Angel on that. She said, "She's the only one who said that I'm much too optimistic about American America in my book." <laughs> I told her she's the only one I've ever, she's ever told me that, but I, I appreciate it. <laughs> well, that's a good note to wrap up on. We are coming up on the hour, so unfortunately we do have to shut down shortly. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions and comments that were submitted. They look like good questions. Marcy has a few final words. Thank you very much. Well, thank you both very much. That was um, amazing. The answers were amazing and the questions were amazing. And there's so much more to say, but I feel like we, we did get to a lot. So um, thank you for your work. Thank you for your optimism. And um, thank you to everyone who's joined us. Thank you. So uh, we'll be sending you follow-up email. And uh, please keep an eye out for this conversation being posted online and for future Talking Biopolitics conversations. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.